Hey YouTube, it's Dwayne here. So today we're going to be talking about the King James Version. So I have today Timothy Berg, and uh, he's probably the guy that I know who knows the most about the King James Bible. And he is going to share with us his great knowledge on the topic. Timothy, why don't you go ahead and say hello to everybody? Hello. Welcome. I'm glad to be here, Dwayne. I love what you're doing on the channel and excited to be able to contribute in some small way. We're just going to get right into it. The King James Version, I mean, it's a staple. It, it, it's a foundation for the English language. And what I want to know is a, a couple things. One, you wrote an article for Text and Canon called, I, I think it was Seven Myths About the King James Version. I want to touch a little bit on those and maybe over the next little while we'll, we'll release some content from our conversation here. But before we get into that, I just want to ask you just straight up, you know, what were the circumstances surrounding the translation of the King James Bible? What, what brought it about? Yeah, man, that's a that's a huge question. So there's a lot going on politically and in kind of the socio-political religious context at that time. And we tend to think of politics and religion as two different things. But in England at the time, of course, they're, they're basically the same thing. They're not separated because of the state church. So what happens initially is there are these fault lines or divisions that take place in the Church of England during the reign of Elizabeth, actually long before the reign of Elizabeth. If you study the history of the English Reformation, usually when we talk about the Reformation, we think of theological revival that takes place right, because right. of Martin Luther and stuff on the on the larger continent um, in Europe and Germany. There's this big fight over justification by faith and right. um, the role of scripture as the central authority. And it's a theological debate. In England, the Reformation takes place in a very different way. It doesn't start with theology. It starts with King Henry wanting to get an annulment to his marriage to mm -hmm. Catherine of Aragon. The church won't allow that, but he wants to marry Anne Boleyn, you know, the famous love story that had developed there. So right. he breaks from the Catholic church, not so much for theological reasons and only later adopts kind of a Protestant theological scheme. So the Reformation in England kind of happens by fits and starts. It's really slow. It'll move forward a little bit and then back up, move forward a little bit. And it gets really tumultuous because King Henry's children, you know, all three of his children, Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth end up reigning and they take the country in different directions. Mary, of course, right. while she's queen, we call her Bloody Mary. She takes the entire country in a Catholic direction. But then with his Protestant children, they tend to move it in a Protestant direction. But Edward doesn't live long enough for the Reformation to really be completed. So Reformation just goes goes up and down in England until Elizabeth right. reigns. And during the reign of Elizabeth, there are several acts of parliament that are passed that we refer to as the Elizabethan settlement. Things okay. finally kind of settle in England. And what the settlement means is it's a Protestant church. The Church of England is a Protestant church in its theology, but it still retains Catholic ceremony. So it's the only church right. in all of the Protestant world that still has a structure of bishops and episcopates. It's the only church that still has the robes and the special hats that have to be worn, Right, right. Um, the special liturgy that's contained in the Book of Common Prayer. So a lot of people were uncomfortable with that, um, especially the Puritans, or we could just speak more broadly yeah. non-conformist, right? You know, right. they're like, hey, right, this right. isn't fair. You're you're too Catholic for us. You sound too Catholic. <laughs> you're, you're Catholic. You're talking yeah. Catholic. You're, you're <laughs> yeah, just back, exactly. backdoor Catholic. Stop it. Backdoor Catholics. Yeah, the, yeah. One of the phrases that went around a lot of that time, they would right. say, well, the church is but halfway reformed. Like we haven't finished the reformation yet. So there's a kind of a whole spectrum of discontented peoples. And then there are those that are the conformists that love where the settlement has landed and are perfectly content to keep it. Well, when Elizabeth dies and King James is set to take the throne, that fight kind of revives in people's hearts and everybody's thinking, oh, okay, this is our chance to push our side of the party, our side of the debate. King James, as he's coming to the throne, receives loads and loads of different petitions. People saying, hey, basically take our side in the fight, take our side in the fight. One of those petitions is the famous millinery petition, supposedly signed by a thousand different ministers that list out a, a whole load of grievances. As a result of that petition, King James calls the Hampton Court Conference in January in 1604 and okay. raises all these issues, basically says, hey, I'm becoming king. I want to know what is it that you guys are looking for? What is it that you're discontent about? He doesn't really submit to or acquiesce to almost anything that they're asking for, except right. that on the second day of the conference, John Reynolds proposes the idea for a new translation of the Bible. And he latches onto that and goes, oh, that is a good idea. Let's do that. And so really the King James Bible is born in that moment as this debate is taking place between conformist and nonconformist. And it's suggested by a Puritan spokesman, but since it's going to be controlled by the king and by the church, it's going to be a conformist document, but one that was asked for by the nonconformist. So, right. so King James's hope for it is really that it would be a tool to kind of heal this divide right. and unite people politically around this one version. What had happened just prior to the King James being produced, things had kind of settled along the lines of two different versions that were being used 
I should say three versions. Roman Catholics, of course, were using the Latin Vulgate, and then the yeah. Douay Rhymes was being slowly produced. Uh, one testament had been done in 1582. I think the other one was released in 1609, something like that. So the whole Bible wasn't done yet. Some Catholics that were still in England, not officially part of the Church of England, that's their go-to Bible. Right. The official church Bible at that time was the Bishop's Bible, which a lot of people were unhappy with. They didn't like the language of it. They didn't mm. like the translation of it, but it was the official quote-unquote church Bible. But what most of the quote-unquote men in the pew, the average average man on the street, especially the Puritans, were using and loving was the Geneva Bible that had been done in Geneva by refugees from Mary, and it was thoroughly right, Protestant, right. you know, it had been worked on. Uh, you've got Calvin's influence in Beza, and it's absolutely a thoroughly Protestant Bible, thoroughly Reformed Bible. The fault line kind of ends up developing into English Bibles as well. Not not strictly. I don't want to draw a strict line there, yeah, but yeah. there's this debate, and it kind of lands on the Bible that is being used. You go to church, and you're going to hear the Bishop's Bible read, but in your private devotions, you're very likely to be reading a Geneva Bible. Uh, so James hopes okay, that this okay. new project here's this new bible we can commission it and it will help to heal that divide so that's, that's kind of his ultimate goal so the the king james version was uh, like born out of political necessity uh, yeah, that people were so. starting to stand up and and, and fight each other I, was there any physical violence like were they actually like you know fisticuffs um, you know most of to... the time no there are some meetings of parliament uh famous meetings of parliament where things did get violent and violence was threatened and there, there were i mean people had stakes in this particular fight for, for right. so for example one of the big things was about uh, vestments that a cleric had to wear when he was performing, you know, the rites or, or <laughs> right. administering the sacraments. And he had to wear this hat that, you know, you've seen the okay, pictures of okay. the four cornered hat that Erasmus has on. Yeah, uh, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. You know, this required vestment. Well, some of the Puritans were so upset about that, that one of them had famously trained his dog anytime he saw one of those hats to jump up and grab it off the priest's head. <laughs> so he'd come into this room, his dog <laughs> would amazing. jump up, grab your hat and run off with it. So uh, this, yeah, I mean, they were very rough fights, but they were also, they were friends. The people on both sides yeah, that's divide. Funny. We're both serving in the church. They they cared about each other and they were friends. Right, they just right. saw things very different. So so it's not like a Saint Nick punching Arius in the face kind of deal. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> it's not people at war so yeah. much. It's not yeah. quite a civil war yet. Okay. Now it does okay. become a civil war later. A few decades after the King James is released, of course, the famous English civil war breaks out. Right. Really, we usually call it today the War of the Three Kingdoms because it involves Scotland and Ireland. All of that happens. Interestingly, that doesn't happen under King James. It happens under his son, which is mm. really a testament to how good King James James the sixth and first was at holding things together and right. his son just really didn't have that skill and so the fault lines continued they broke out <laughs> right. again and literal civil war right. broke out at that right. point that's a quick kjv starting in a nutshell i commend you for taking all that information and sucking it down into a quick 10 minute blurb uh so you have a website called uh, kjvhistory.com if you go there uh, you've got tremendous amount of information just about the king james bible where it came from how it was done all that kind of good stuff how long have you had that website up for? Oh gosh, that's a good question. I think I set it up. Uh, Mark Ward helped me set it up maybe two years ago, three years ago, something like that. A lot oh, of the yeah. articles though, I actually had on a previous website that I've run and I just moved them over. Um, okay, so I've been okay. really slowly producing new content. <laughs> right, if people right. subscribe to the blog, I can tell you my plan. I've been really slow to do it the last year or so, but my plan is to eventually blog my way through the entire creation of the King James and then blog my way through the the reception history of the King James over its uh, long history. So that's, that's where awesome. we're headed. But I am really slow about producing blog articles. So <laughs> that's right. Take takes time, right? That's that's the mm -hmm. uh, the death cry of most of the stuff we want to do. Yes. <laughs>